Nice to see you all here. I'm George Gephardt, President and CEO of the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University. And I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's special forum entitled Climate Change, A New Dialogue. No doubt most of you have seen the extraordinary preparations our city is making to welcome the leader of one of the world's great faith traditions. But as exciting as the papal visit promises to be for Philadelphia, we are even more excited about the, by the encyclical letter that the Pope released earlier this summer. This document, which by now is well known to much of the world, summarized in plain, clear language the same warning that scientists have been cautiously making for the last 20 years. That is, our planet is facing tremendous challenges. In the words of the encyclical, quote, climate change is a global problem with grave implications. It represents one of the principal challenges facing humanity in our day. As the Pope message Pope's message coincides with his long-anticipated visit to Philadelphia, we realized this was a unique opportunity for the Academy to present the issue of climate change from both a scientific and a human perspective. Tonight's, pro uh, tonight's program is intended to do just that. Climate change is certainly not a new issue for us at the Academy. Our scientists have been studying the impacts and implications of global warming for over 20 years, from the mountains of Mongolia to the shores of New Jersey. We've also had many public programs that have touched on the issue. For tonight's discussion, however, we recognize an increasing urgency to the problem. Our work in Mongolia, for example, has already charted effects of climate change on herding communities whose very livelihoods are already being threatened by changes in temperature and rain patterns. Evidence is starting to show that disruption of the planet's ecosystem does not lie in the distant future, but is being seen right now in many places around the world, often by some of the world's most vulnerable populations. To help understand this, we are very pleased tonight to have with us some of the foremost experts in the world on climate change, on social justice, and on urban sustainability. I feel humbled to introduce these folks in that I think everybody here knows them, but let me honor and thank Jeffrey Sachs, our keynote speaker, who was one of the key advisors in drafting the encyclical letter. Michael Oppenheimer has been one of the leaders of the scientific community's call for action on climate change. As a champion of environmental justice, Jackie Patterson is working to address climate change on behalf of the people most likely to be impacted by it. And as always, we are pleased to have Philadelphia's Director of Sustainability, Catherine Gajewski, here to highlight our own city's impressive efforts to address the problem. Before we begin, I want to thank all of our speakers and all of you for joining us this evening. For those of you who have attended our many evening programs in the past, tonight will be the first of several we have planned in the coming year. We know how important these discussions are for framing and raising awareness on the key issues of our time. We hope you will join us in November to hear noted Australian scientist and author Tim Flannery. Dr. Flannery is past winner of the Academy's prestigious Leidy Medal, and we look forward to hearing him speak on his latest work. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague from Drexel University, Shannon Marquez. Shannon is Associate Vice Provost of Global Health and International Development from our School of Public Health, and Shannon will moderate this evening's presentation. Thank you all for coming. Good evening. This evening, I'm excited to join you here at the Academy for this important discussion that's bringing together environmental advocates, scientists, and community members for a critical conversation about climate change in the future. Our dialogue this evening is quite timely. 
The United Nations Climate Change Conference will be held in Paris, France in December. The Obama administration unveiled a major climate change plan, and as George mentioned, on the occasion of Pope Francis's visit to Philadelphia, we are minded that in his recent encyclical, the Pope called for a new dialogue about how we're shaping the future of our planet, a conversation which includes everyone. Since the environmental challenges we are undergoing and its human roots concern and affect all of us. In keeping with these issues, our panelists this evening will discuss the critical issues and address how science, environmental justice, urban planning, and policy can provide solutions to help society and especially its most vulnerable members adapt to climate change. Our panel of prominent thought leaders will begin with a featured keynote from Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. Then we'll have short presentation and remarks by our additional panelists. Jeffrey Sachs is the director of the Earth Institute, Quinlet Professor of Sustainable Development, and Professor of Health Policy and Management at Columbia University. He is a leading advisor to the Vatican on climate change and sustainable development, as well as special advisor to the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki moon having held the same position under former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. He is also director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and co-founder and chief strategist of Millennium Promise Alliance. Uh, among many of his other uh, directorships and leadership also relate to being a commissioner of the UNESCO Broadband Commission for Development. He has authored three New York Times bestsellers in the past seven years, including The End of Poverty, Commonwealth Economics for a Crowded Planet, and The Price of Civilization. And his most recent books are To Move the World, JFK's Quest for Peace, and the Age of Sustainable Development. Professor Sachs is widely considered to be one of the world's leading experts on economic development and the fight against poverty. His work on ending poverty, promoting economic growth, fighting hunger and disease, and promoting sustainable environmental practices has taken him to more than 125 countries with more than 90% of the world's population. Prior to his role at Columbia, he spent over 20 years at Harvard University, most recently as the director of the Center for International Development and the Galen L. Stone Professor of International Trade. A native of Detroit, Michigan, he's received his BA, MA, and PhD degrees at Harvard. Please welcome Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. Thank you very much, and good evening, everybody. What a great week we have coming up, huh? It's not every week you have the Pope coming. Uh, and uh, it's not every week we have the Pope coming to the United Nations and speaking to the Congress. And God, do they need that, right? Uh, so it's, it's really exciting. And I am just sitting on the edge of my seat to see whether any of these congressmen will listen, uh, which they're not very good at doing. Um, but they better listen because the message is really important and really timely. And indeed, uh, our backs are to the wall uh, because we have waited a long time to address the issues that we're going to be discussing tonight. And um, we don't have much time left if we're going to avoid some really, really serious consequences of our neglect. This week could turn out to be one of the most important weeks in modern times, not only because of the Pope's visit, although that's cool enough and we'll always remember that, but because the United Nations on Friday will adopt a new framework agreement among the 193 member states of the United Nations around the concept of sustainable development, which is what I'm going to be discussing briefly. And if we actually live up to what's going to be agreed on Friday, and for a change, we actually know what's going to be agreed because the document was finished on August 2nd. So it's just waiting to be gaveled by the heads of state, but not before the Pope speaks to them in the morning. So it's very, very important. But if we live up to what 
will be agreed on Friday. This will be a momentous time and a very promising time. If we fail to heed what is going to be agreed, if it just becomes another dead letter, and we all know that that is very, very possible with UN documents and UN agreements and uh, so forth, then we're going to be in a lot of trouble. So whatever happens this week, it's going to determine a lot of our future. Either we get it right and we follow through, or we continue in our neglect. I want to just spend a few minutes to describe what's, what's at stake. We're entering a new era, or at least we better be. So on Friday, at the end of the day, we will have SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. These will be the globally agreed goals for cooperation among the United Nations member states. And they have the key operative phrase in them, sustainable development. I'm very excited about that because my title is Professor of Sustainable Development, <laughs> which I took uh, 13 years ago so that people would say, what's that? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, because there aren't too many professors of sustainable development, but I'm hoping there will be lots of them in the future. Sustainable development is a concept that started to be discussed around 1987 when Dr. Gru Harlem Brundtland, who's one of the great statesmen of our time, she was Prime Minister of Norway and asked to chair a commission to look at the question of the environment and global economic development. And the commission came up with the concept of sustainable development or put it on the global radar screen back in 1987. And the idea is in one way or another to harmonize our desire for economic prosperity and our respect for nature. We haven't gotten that anywhere close to being right yet. When this concept was first discussed back in 1987, the phrase was more or less that each generation should meet its needs in a way that will allow future generations to meet their needs. In other words, don't wreck the planet along the way. But now, as it's going to be adopted this Friday, and boy, I'm excited to say that because I've been talking about this for three years. These have been negotiated for three years. Now it's Friday uh, that it's coming up. The concept is a put in a little bit different terms. It is that we need an integrative or holistic approach that combines three basic objectives of society, economic, social, and environmental. It says we want a good economy, we want prosperity, we want to end extreme poverty. That's all part of the environmental, uh, part of the economic pillar. We want more fairness, at least that's what they're going to agree on, although not all these politicians uh, live that way day to day, certainly. But we call that in the UN social inclusion. It means a renewed emphasis on human rights, which have been part of the moral charter of the UN since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, gender equality, ensuring that girls have every chance, like boys, to be in school, to stay in school, to participate, to be empowered politically, socially, legally, and to narrow the income inequalities that have widened so dramatically in our society. We haven't had gaps between the rich and the poor in our country for, at, like we do now, for at least a century. And it's run completely out of control with a kind of feedback loop that you know, sometime 10 or 15 years ago, our politics became nonstop about billionaires. And that's what we have right now. It's either you are a billionaire, like that weird guy on TV every day, uh, or he claims to be a billionaire, I don't know. Uh, or he's broke, but he puts on a good show. Or you have a billionaire in, uh, on your side, and that's what our politics became. And so we have a widening 
gap between the rich and the poor. And the third pillar that we haven't addressed, even though we've known about it now for decades, the first global meeting on the question of how economy and environment should harmonize was in 1972 in Stockholm. And then in 1992, many of you will recall the Earth Summit in Rio. And we're now 43 years into this, and we haven't actually taken practical steps. What we've been doing, as I'll emphasize, is running uh, roughshod over nature, and that's what in part prompted Pope Francis to make this most remarkable encyclical. And I do have to correct the introduction. There was no drafting committee. This is Pope Francis. And when you read it, you know it, by the way. It's magnificent. It's beautiful. There is no way a committee could have written this document. <laughs> now, what there was was a lot of discussion and meetings and consultations and, uh, and uh, symposia and workshops. And uh, the Vatican brought in many of the world's leading scientists over a three-year period. And I was very honored and thrilled, I can tell you, to take part in a lot of those meetings. But then Pope Francis went off and wrote something. <laughs> and that's why it is abs And the top cardinals, everyone was wondering, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? <laughs> Nobody knew. And so believe me, this is his. And when you read it, you absolutely know it. It's just one of the most beautiful, succinct, precise, inspiring documents of our time. And uh, so uh, I wasn't at all part of the drafting, but I was part of watching uh, how uh, the Vatican uh, considered this issue. And it was really one of the finest displays, in my view, in modern times of what the church calls the marriage of faith and reason, or faith and science, which is a long-standing concept of the Roman Catholic Church, that this is not science versus faith. This is science and faith together. And that's what is really represented in this encyclical. So Friday, we have the sustainable development goals. Now, OK, there are 17 of them. You will go home and Google them. And then you will remember them. And I promise you'll be the first person at work, in your families, among your friends, to know them. And then you will tell your friends you can know them too. And like a chain letter, we will have everyone in the world knowing them soon enough, because we really need to. Now, I did fight a rear guard action at the UN for three years, complete failure, saying, let's just keep it to 10. Uh, and I pointed out that Moses kept it to 10 uh, in his uh, consultations with the Lord. Uh, I said, why do we need three and a half tablets? Couldn't we just have uh, two and so forth? But 193 governments, when they negotiate, they started with about 300 goals, and they whittled them down to 17. And it's still a great accomplishment. It is a consensus. And this consensus was reached in three years of discussion because it was in 2012 that the government said, we better have goals to get the public engaged. This is not for the technocrats. This is not for the experts. This is for the whole world to say, we need a new sustainable development direction. So what are these goals? Just to give you a quick idea, several of them are about ending privation and extreme poverty. In fact, goal number one I really like. It is that we should end extreme poverty by the year 2030. Extreme poverty is a technical term used by the World Bank. It's a precise, it's not a precise measure, but it's a precise definition, poorly measured, of who lives below a certain global poverty line. And the estimate is that in today's world, it's about 800 or 900 million people. That's a lot of people, but mind you, there are 7.3 billion people on the planet, so the poverty rate has come down a lot, actually. 
and it's possible to reach zero by 2030. I think that goal's pretty cool because 10 years ago I wrote a book called The End of Poverty, and I said in our generation we could end extreme poverty. And 10 years ago it was a little bit more rocky reception, I would say. Uh, oh, come on, that's a little bit of a dream and so forth. And now the governments have adopted this goal with the time certain 2030 to do it. It's feasible, it's no shoe in It would take a real effort and really caring to do it because it will not happen by itself. There are a number of other goals that are like this to ensure that everybody has access to basic needs. I really love goals three and four. Goal three, which says good health there, is calling for universal health coverage. Someday even the United States will get it. Uh, we, we inched a little bit forward, but the idea is that in every place in the world, people should have access to basic health services. This too is feasible and at quite low cost, not with all our fancy health care, but at least the basics could be reached for everybody. And goal number four, which is extremely important, is education for all. And what it calls for specifically is universal completion of at least secondary school for all girls and boys in the world with quality. It's a big deal because in poor places, still only 20% of the kids complete secondary school, for example. And this says that by 2030, there should be universal completion rates. It's one of the most important things we could do for safety, for world security, for sharing economic prosperity, for gender equality. It's got everything right going for it, and now it's a global goal. Two more that I'll point out on the list is SDG number 11 called Sustainable Cities. The idea is that the nations are saying to the cities, so here we are in Philadelphia, the cities should take on these goals and have coherent plans for sustainable development in, at the city level. And I'm delighted that in my own city, New York City, we have a plan of Mayor de Blasio, one NYC, which is a sustainable development plan. And we want cities all over the world to do this. And on Friday evening, I'll be hosting a reception of mayors from all over the world and Governor Jerry Brown and some other subnational leaders, governors and provincial leaders to say that this isn't only the nations but also the communities. Very, very important. And then goal number 13, I'll point out, is for climate action. And important to understand is that these goals are not legally binding. They're motivational, they're moral, which is, by the way, what we really need. Because if you make them legally binding, then the lawyers spend the next 20 years arguing about what they mean. Whereas if you make them a moral commitment, that's for us. That's for us to say this is good, this is right, this is important. It's for kids everywhere in schools to learn them. It's for NGOs to take them on and say we must do this in every level. This is not for the technocrats, although the technocrats do need to come in to say how do you do these things? What does it really mean? But the purpose of these goals is to have them for the world, for the people, and everywhere. Now, this agenda will be adopted on Friday evening. Gavel, done, new 15 years to apply from January 1, 2016 to December 31st, 2030. But they'll be put to a test in just a few weeks because the same governments will then meet in Paris starting on November 30 and continuing to the target completion of December 10 at what's called COP21. COP is Conference of the Parties, meaning the signatory countries of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. That is law. You wouldn't know it by our, our behavior, by the way. 
because we break the law every day. But under the U.S. Constitution, when we have a treaty, that's U.S. law, but we're not honoring it. And a lot of the rest of the world isn't honoring it. That was signed in 1992. If you could imagine then a president named George Bush signed this treaty. Very unusual to remember how fast our politics got completely, totally wrecked in this country. But we used to have a time when it was possible to have a bipartisan agreement that you would sign a nice treaty like that with the rest of the world. Now it seems in Congress if you say the rest of the world's for it, that guarantees we have to be against it. Because we become really weird, ladies and gentlemen. And we should move the Capitol back to Philadelphia, I think. Uh, so this is the 21st meeting of the parties, COP21. Why? Because the convention was signed in 1992, and it went into force when enough governments ratified it in 1994. And then the first meeting took place in Berlin in 1995, COP1. Then at COP3, the Kyoto Protocol was uh, adopted, which you'll recall we signed but never ratified because our Senate made this monstrous resolution, this horrible, stupid, illiterate resolution called the Hegel-Byrd Amendment which said, we're not going to do anything until and unless the developing countries do the same thing, which was a complete violation of what the treaty itself said, which said the rich countries should move first. So that's just how we behave. We think we can get along doing whatever we want. We never signed Kyoto Protocol. It never accomplished much. In the meantime, China grew and became the biggest polluter also in absolute size. Twice the U.S., half per capita, but big, uh, enough to wreck the world all by themselves, by the way, if they were to continue on the current trajectory with the amount of carbon dioxide they're putting into the air. Then in 2009, we were going to have at COP15 the real agreement. <laughs> Failed. I don't know if you remember, but there was a scramble at the end with all these heads of state around the table, and then Obama said, I got to go. It's starting to snow in, in Washington. I can't be late. He was off. No agreement. Uh, and that was uh, this world system is like the biggest oil tanker you can imagine. It doesn't turn in direction very fast. And so they said when that failed in Copenhagen, OK, 2015, we're really going to do it. In other words, we'll regroup in six years. Thankfully, it's not an emergency. We have all the time in the world. Um, and uh, so here we are. So the point I'm making is that we're going to sign this moral compact, and then we're going to negotiate in Paris. And either we will or we won't honor what we are agreeing this week. So very quickly, some good news, it's not all bad news in the world. We're in an age of rapid technological change. We have phones so cool we couldn't even have imagined them 10 years ago. I don't know about you, but I think it's pretty great. And I can tell you working in villages in Africa, it's unbelievable what information technology is making possible that wasn't possible a few years ago. A few years ago, a rural area was just an isolated place. Today, you can call an ambulance. Today, you can get help. Today, your child can stay alive. Uh, today, you can know how to market your food. Many things have changed very quickly and for the good. And that's why poverty rates are coming down. That's good news. Now, another thing that we see is a complicated graph. It's a bunch of countries on a scatter plot. And on the horizontal axis is how uh, countries rate in terms of the performance of their 15-year-old students on an internationally standardized science and math test, what's called the PISA test. The United States is, by the way, somewhere in the middle of this curve. We're definitely not at the top end on average. And on this axis, the vertical axis is how fast 
uh, the country is growing economically. Well, these are the real superstars. Uh, they're doing great in school, and they grow very fast, and the places on the bottom end have poor school performance, and the purpose of this graph is to show, gee, it makes a difference how well your schools are doing. It's probably the most important single determinant of long-term economic growth at this point. And we have a lot of crisis of a lot of places where the kids just aren't learning or aren't even in school. So poverty's coming down, and we know how to keep it coming down. Quality education is number one. And so that's part of why SDG 4 is so prominently featured, that we need universal quality education. But here's the real crisis part of this, what the scientists call planetary boundaries. What do they mean by boundaries? They mean that the Earth is a system. It's a dynamic of the water cycle, of the carbon cycle, of the nitrogen cycle. And if humanity, because of the size of our operations, Humanity Inc. is a hundred trillion dollar a year enterprise now. 7.3 billion people, average production per person about $13,000 now. We're a big enterprise. One species out of the 10 to 100 million, we don't know how many there are, but maybe 10 million species, but one of them commands the show. And we've become awfully big, and what we're doing to the planet is now so large that we're trespassing or absolutely deranging basic functions of the Earth's complex system. So we're changing the climate, we're depleting fresh water access in many different ways. Of course, we're deforesting, we're destroying the habitat of millions of species. We're even acidifying the whole ocean. That's a big bathtub to acidify. But it's a measure of how much carbon dioxide we're putting into the air by burning coal, oil, and gas that when in such volumes that that dissolves in the ocean water, we've already increased the acidity of the ocean by about 30% compared to the pre-industrial level. And that threatens the whole marine ecosystems, the coral reefs, and much else. So the concept of planetary boundaries says stop at safe limits. And we just are not good at limits, are we? If you are told that's a limit, you want to go over it, it seems, as a human being. Uh, and this is really the biggest challenge that the Sustainable Development Goals are trying to address, which is, yes, we want to end poverty. Yes, we want to share prosperity. But we have to do it staying within the planetary boundaries. And you know the news just is bad. This year is going to be the hottest year on instrument record. Last year was the hottest year on instrument record. That means going back to 1880. But actually, probably going back, well, certainly for hundreds of years, probably for thousands of years, and soon for to temperatures and a climate system we've not seen for more than 100,000 years since the last interglacial uh, period uh, about 130,000 years ago. So we've got a mess. And one thing I can also assure you in my role as UN advisor, I go to a lot of countries and I'm traveling constantly. I was in South Africa just a couple of days ago. Every place I go, and I'm not exaggerating, it's not hyperbole, every place has massive climate derangement now. You really go and you talk about the weather. And when I was in South Africa a couple of days ago, there are huge drought everywhere. Very serious droughts. There's a hunger crisis coming for southern Africa, partly related to the giant El Nino that we're having, but it's an El Nino that is on top of this long-term warming trend. This morning I was on a video conference with Columbia, not my university, but the country, and there is a massive drought underway. And that coffee prices, uh, coffee crops are down, coffee prices going up. 
uh, and obviously problems much worse than that. And just for you in Philly and uh, I in Manhattan, we're going to have to take a boat to work if we continue this way because one of the most important aspects of human-induced climate change, of course, is the threat to the sea level through the disintegration of the great ice sheets of Antarctica and even Greenland. And a colleague of mine, Jim Hansen, uh, who is perhaps America's leading climate scientist, we like to think so at Columbia University, he was NASA's lead scientist for the last 30 years before retiring this year, and a very brave and brilliant man who fought with the White House constantly to be able to tell the truth to the American people, has just written a paper about a month ago saying that the last time we had temperatures of the kind that we're soon to reach, the ocean level was six meters higher than now. And his argument is from many different physical arguments as well as the so-called paleoclimate record that there's a good reason to worry about the rapid disintegration of West Antarctic ice sheet, which would raise the sea level many meters and be absolutely devastating for a lot of the world, the part of the world shown in red. And uh, that includes Manhattan, unfortunately, and it includes Philly, it includes the eastern seaboard, and it includes little areas like this where about 100 million people live uh, in uh, the uh, delta of the Brahmaputra and the Ganges River known as Bangladesh. In other words, this is no joke. It's extraordinarily serious. We don't have a time stamp on this, but it could be decades, it could be a century, but this is the kind of path that we're on right now. Now, very, very quickly in terms of solutions, let me just say the following. What we're doing on climate change is we're putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, especially carbon dioxide, but several gases that have the property that they trap the heat that Earth would radiate to space, but like a blanket around it, these greenhouse gases trap the infrared outgoing radiation and they warm the Earth. This is not as Senator Imhoff insanely said, a hoax. This is not some crazy new science. This is or some crazy new uh, hypothesis. This is not uh, scientists uh, scrounging for and grubbing for science uh, grants from the US government. There are better ways to make a living, by the way. Uh, this is deeply established science for everybody in the world except Rupert Murdoch and the US Republican Congress. Other than, other than that, it is not open for question. Because if this isn't right, by the way, everything else about science isn't right, and your phones, which work on the quantum mechanics and all the rest, they don't work. Nothing else is right. Now, there's uncertainties about the precise responses of the climate system to changes of gas concentrations, but the basic physics, not a question. And what we know from that is that we're going to get a tremendous amount of destabilizing warming if we continue to use coal, oil, and gas the way we're doing it. And with a lot of the world still to develop, we would on a business as usual path have a continuing rise of these greenhouse gas emissions, whether this curve or this curve in a famous picture that was made by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. For us to remain roughly safe, we have to do this to emissions. They've been going up, up, up. Now we have to peak within the next few years and then start bringing them down to zero. We have to decarbonize the energy system is the technical term. We have to, by the second half of this century, stop relying on coal, oil, and gas 
and rely instead on wind and solar and hydro and geothermal and nuclear and what is uh, called carbon capture and sequestration, which is the one technology that we have where you could at least potentially use coal, oil, or gas, but capture the carbon dioxide and put it someplace. But we have to reach zero in whatever we're doing. By the way, there's no perfect energy. Everyone is a problem. Environmentalists generally don't like any kind of energy system. <laughs> My friends, they don't like wind turbines off of Nantucket. They don't like hydropower in dams that displace people or displace nature. They don't like solar panels in deserts that disrupt the, solar, the uh, desert ecology. They don't like any of it. I will tell you, I happen to love electricity. I don't know about you, but I work in a lot of places that don't have it. The children die young. They don't get educated. The food's unsafe. Everything's wrong with that picture. Energy is good. Modern energy services are crucial for our standard of living. I like our standard of living, by the way, because I spend a lot of time in very poor places. I don't recommend it. We don't want fairness by poverty everywhere. It took a long time to build out of poverty. We want to spread prosperity that is sustainable. We need energy for that. So we're going to have to make some choices. In my view, the first choice is decarbonize. I know when I said nuclear, a few people gasped. But I believe nuclear probably has to be part of the mix because it is essentially a zero carbon energy supply. And a lot of places are going to use nuclear energy, definitely. China, India, uh, China, India Korea, Japan, the UK, if you read the Financial Times today, uh, has uh, announced that China will build its new nuclear power plant in Sussex. The world's weird, you know? It's interesting. Uh, very, uh, so the point is you, we're, we need to make choices. And I believe that our choices should be getting down to zero and having energy, both of them, and not saying we're not going to have any energy. Incidentally, most places that try to make the changes then get stopped by someone who doesn't like the next thing. So Germany is trying an energy transition, but they're using more, and they want to get out of fossil fuels, but they're using more coal now. Why? Because they built the wind turbines in the North Sea, but the states in Germany in between the North Sea and the Bavarian industry don't want the power lines going through. And so they can't connect the renewable energy. And then Chile wanted to build a big hydropower plant. And it was torpedoed when a lot of American high-profile environmentalists went to Chile and said, don't build those dams. So they're using more fossil fuels. So the point is we're kind of stuck in this <laughs> business as usual disaster rather than finding a way forward. I keep saying I gotta, I'm way over time, I know. Uh, but let me just uh, finish uh, quickly to say if we're actually going to do this, in other words, how do you achieve these goals that I talked about, you need plans, you need expertise, you need actually technical thinking. And we need a word that we don't like very much in the United States. That's long-term planning, uh, which the US, you know, don't think the market will do it for you. And if you look at the market, it's clear the market doesn't think at all, actually. Uh, so we're going to need to think ahead 50 years and make plans about how to decarbonize the energy system in this country. And there are three basic pillars of that. Energy efficiency, certainly, decarbonizing the power system, and moving to low carbon or zero carbon fuels, mainly ending after a century the internal combustion engine, basically, and we all get to drive Teslas in the future. Uh, and uh, 
If you've done that recently, that's also good news. Not as, not as much fun as the Pope coming, but it's on the list. Uh, definitely uh, an absolutely good thing. So we're going to have to move to electric vehicles or fuel cell vehicles, but they'll have to be zero emission vehicles. There are actually 10 different pathways to that. You can make synthetic liquids by taking CO2 out of the air, taking energy from solar or wind, and synthetic, uh, making synthetic fuels that's, that are liquids like hydrocarbons. So there are lots of pathways, but we can't have CO2 coming out of the tailpipe from petroleum. There's no way to keep the world safe if we do that. So the point is strategy. One of the things we've been working on for the last three years at the UN is looking at the paths to deep decarbonization. And while I can't elaborate on this, you can start at the beginning of this chart of how we use energy right now and then look forward 35 years, basically, to mid-century and look at scenarios of how we could get to the low-carbon energy system that we're going to need by that point for keeping warming below 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit that is the upper limit that we dare not pass. That's the planetary boundary uh, that is uh, absolutely a, a danger point. Now, I won't even go there. I will go here. Uh, we need a lot of clever innovation. We need new technologies. We need to think ahead. We need our universities for this. So this is just a plug for universities. We're at Drexel right now. Wonderful. This city uh, is filled with wonderful world-leading institutions of research and higher education. This is the key for the world, actually, that we empower the thinking, the knowledge, the technological change. And what I've shown you here is our map of where innovation takes place in this country. Uh, Philadelphia and New York are well represented, and uh, Silicon Valley is well represented uh, on the West Coast. And this is a kind of knowledge-based system that we need to deploy. This is not going to come from Washington per se. Uh, this is going to have to come from developing the knowledge and the technology and the pathways and having our politicians stop faking it, hiding it, or being so corrupt uh, that they don't want to face up to it and getting on with this uh, uh, development. One of the things we're doing at the UN is these are all universities that have signed on to a global partnership for the purpose of working together to develop these technology pathways in the future. And I'm very lucky to be leading this effort on behalf of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. It's called the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And I'm going to come back to Drexel uh, for uh, some engagement on that uh, after, after today. So finally, uh, we need a smile. Uh, let me just recommend to you uh, the wisdom of this encyclical and say that it really does, in my view, provide the, the way to grasp the situation that we're in. It's extraordinarily powerful. It is exactly geared towards our needs. I couldn't have been more excited reading it uh, when uh, it uh, appeared this summer. What it says in the shortest possible uh, terms is that our economy and our society has the purpose of the human good. We don't have an economy that we serve. The economy should serve human well-being. And this may seem like a small distinction, but it's not one that we're getting right. What the encyclical says is that our economic life needs to be within a moral framework. We don't have property rights and market economy for its own sake. We don't put the idea that, well, that's my property. I can do what I want. 
as the starting point for discussion, even though in America we too often do. We say, as the Pope says, no property rights are inviolable in the church's teachings. Property, private property is appropriate. Market economy is actually fine, but not as the end, but only as a means to the common good. And when it is not achieving that by pillaging nature, by destroying social bonds, by grotesque exploitation of human trafficking or bonded labor or what the church has been calling the modern forms of slavery, which trap perhaps 50 million people in really slave conditions around the world and in all countries, including our own, in trafficking and enforced sexual uh, labor and so forth. That's not the kind of economy that we want. And what the Pope's message in essence is, and I want to strongly support it from an economist perspective, is that our core crisis, our core crisis is not an economic crisis. It's not a financial crisis. It is a moral crisis. Because the odd part of our time is that we actually have all of the knowledge that we need. We have all of the technologies either available or within reach. We have all the wealth we could have ever dreamt of. A hundred years ago, unimaginable, the prosperity and the knowledge that we have. But what we don't have is the moral sense to use this for the common good. And what the Pope is calling on us basically is that we need to look once again for the common good. And he has in the encyclical this statement that interdependence obliges us to think of one world with a common plan. Yet the same ingenuity which has brought about enormous technological progress has so far proved incapable of finding effective ways of dealing with grave environmental and social problems worldwide. A global consensus is essential for confronting the deeper problems which cannot be resolved by unilateral actions on the part of individual countries. And I believe that this is the message that Pope Francis will carry to 193 world leaders on Friday morning. By the end of the day, we will at least have the beginnings of a common plan for our common home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. <clears throat> so our next speaker is Dr. Michael Oppenheimer, who's going to give us five to seven minutes of remarks. <laughs> Michael Oppenheimer is the Albert G. Milbank Professor of Geosciences and International Affairs in the Woodrow Wilson School and the Department of Geosciences at Princeton. He's also the director of the program in Science, Technology, and Environmental Policy at the Woodrow Wilson School and faculty associate in atmospheric and ocean sciences at the Princeton Environmental Institute and the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies. Oppenheimer joined the Princeton faculty after more than two decades with the Environmental Defense Fund, a non-governmental environmental organization, where he served as chief scientist and manager of the climate and air program, and he's continued to serve as a science advisor to the EDF to this day. He's also a longtime participant in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. And his interests include science and policy of the atmosphere, particularly climate change and its impacts. Much of his research aims to understand the potential for dangerous outcomes of increasing levels of greenhouse gases by exploring the effects of global warming on the ice sheets and sea level, on the risks from coastal storms, and on patterns of human migration. Among many of the things that he's done in his career, um, some of the most significant relate to in the late 1980s, uh, he and a handful of other scientists 
were the organizers of two workshops under the auspices of the United Nations that helped precipitate the negotiations that resulted in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, as well as the Kyoto Protocol. And during that period, he also co-founded the Climate Action Network, and his research and advocacy work on acid rain also contributed to the passage of the 1990 amendments to the Clean Air Act. It is an honor to welcome him uh, this evening to give some remarks. Thank you so much. So let me add some texture uh, to uh, Jeff's uh, remarks, uh, the lion's share of which I completely agree with. There are some subtle differences about nuclear power, but uh, we will let those pass for the time being. So I look at this problem and I <clears throat> read the Pope's encyclical from the point of view of a scientist, because that's what I've been for the last uh, 40 years or so. And um, so there are different reasons why people become scientists. Some are attracted by the, the explanatory nature of science, uh, at least in some sense it explains parts of the world. Some are attracted by the elegance, just sitting there and watching it work is incredible. I found myself attracted more by the transformative power of science in the sense of the ability to help transform and improve the state of humankind. And I think that's the message that I get from the Pope's encyclical. It's that the marrying of the social framework that the Pope presented with the scientific challenge of climate change reminds us that science has the capability of improving the human situation and our obligation now is to try to figure out how to mobilize what we're smart enough to know to fix the problems that we're stupid enough to create in the first place. Um, and I think if you look at the um, sustainable development goals, if you focus a bit more narrowly on the climate problem itself and look at the attempts to solve it, the most recent manifestation, as Jeff uh, mentioned, is the, um, the meeting coming up in Paris, the Conference of the Parties. You start to realize that the real meaning of the encyclical is that to envision how science will play out in service of the solution of the problem really has to do with doing a better job of appreciating the reality of how humans go about grappling with problems like that. It's very difficult and has proven to be largely unsuccessful to create new institutions de novo, institutions de novo just out of nowhere to impose a solution from the top. That's what we've been doing with climate for the last 25 years. That's partly what the conferences of the parties represent, and although they are critically important, although they provide a global focal point for the attention of people and governments, they aren't really where the problem is going to be solved. Where the problem is going to be solved is on a more uh, quotidian basis, where we look at the way people are actually carrying out business, looking at their the way they daily make decisions, what their preferences are, what the incentives are that get them to move. And therefore, the actual solution, which is starting to happen in my view, is happening at a more local level, at a, at a national level, a regional level, and a local level. It's reflected in things like the progress that's being made in California, where Governor Brown has done some remarkable things to to try to solve the climate change problem. It's, be, it's reflected in the agreement that was made last November between the US and China, where both countries committed to goals to reduce their emissions, but where China's major motivation had not much to do with the threat of climate change. It had something to do with it. But in the first instance, it had to do with the fact that the same actions will cut China's awful air pollution problem. And by the way, China was, has been making a lot of money in the renewable energy markets and would love to see the rest of the world buying its solar and wind technologies. Though it, and it, it's reflected in the, the negotiation of uh, what's loosely called the agreement on trade in green goods and services, where countries are getting together not to reduce climate change, emissions related to climate change, but are getting together to improve the ability to make money trading in goods like solar cells by eliminating the obstacles which reduce the efficiencies of those markets. 
And finally, it's reflected in efforts like the ability of the, the desire on the parts of many countries to get together and agree on coordinate, coordinating technology standards for things like renewable energy so it's easier to sell their products across borders. All these types of things are going on anyway. And the key to solving the climate problem is now to get into the business of understanding why countries do what they do on a day-to-day -day basis and attach the climate goals to those processes, many of which are already underway. At the same time, at the other, if you flip the climate change problem around, and you'll hear more about this from uh, my colleagues um, who are gonna speak in a minute, we have the problem of adaptation. Climate change is already happening. We need to adapt to it, we need to adjust, we need to anticipate, we need to be more resilient. And we don't do a very good job of this already. The fact is we're way behind in dealing with the potential for the kinds of weather-related disasters that happen anyway that have nothing to do with climate change, but many of which, like extreme storms coupling with sea level rise to cause coastal flooding, or like extreme heat waves, which are becoming more common, we need to do a better job in those. And that's also a matter of understanding what people listen to, how they understand scientific information, what information they'll react to, and how to make plans which are not, you know, sort of all top down, but are meaningful to people in the communities where the, where the risk actually plays out. So that's my message for today, that science is all well and good, but unless it's wrapped in an understanding of how people actually operate at all scales, whether it's in the community, whether it's firms, whether it's governments at the local, regional, and national level, we're not gonna get anywhere. Fortunately, I tend to see some progress right now, and I'm not entirely pessimistic. I'm even a little optimistic. Thank you. Okay, our next panelist is Jacqueline Patterson, National Director of the NAACP Climate and Environmental Justice Program. Jackie attended Boston University where she gained a bachelor's in special education. And also during a 3.5 or three and a half year term as a volunteer with the US Peace Corps in Jamaica, she worked with the Community Environmental Research Center, which began due to the contamination of the Harborview community water supply by the neighboring Shell Oil Company plant. After the Peace Corps, Jackie went on to earn two master's degrees, a master's in public health and a master's in social work from Johns Hopkins University and the University of Maryland, respectively. She has worked as a trainer, organizer, researcher, program manager, and policy analyst on international and domestic issues and social justice movements with organizations including Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, Baltimore City Healthy Start, IMA World Health, United for a Fair Economy, Action Aid, Health Gap, and the organization she co-founded, Women of Color United. She's now the Climate Justice Initiative Director for the NAACP, and her work on climate justice before engaging the NAACP was through Women of Color United's participation in a movement generation for change ecology justice retreat and partnerships with the Women's Environment and Development Organization on the From Katrina to Hope Copenhagen initiative. She's also facilitated partnerships between NAACP and Women of Color United to engage in the Women of Color Climate Justice Road Tour to uplift stories of differential impact, community self-reliance, and community resistance of women of color and communities of color. Please welcome Jackie Patterson. Okay, good evening. Um, so this will be 68 slides in seven minutes, um, but I'm gonna try to talk very fast. But um, basically I wanna tell you the story of some of the, the work that we do in some of the communities that are impacted by climate change, both on the side in terms of the drivers of climate change, like coal-fired power plants, and how communities are impacted by the drivers, how communities are impacted by even some of the false solutions that are being, be, being advanced, and then how communities are affected on by, by the impacts of climate change, including 
severe weather events, shifts in agricultural yields, sea, sea level rise. And then finally, just wrapping up with some of the solutions that we're advancing at the community level in terms of policy and the types of partnerships that we're engaging in. So this will be, <laughs> again, in seven minutes. We'll see how that goes. Um, so the objectives of our program are to reduce harmful emissions, particularly greenhouse gases, to advance a justice-based energy agenda, which we are framing around energy democracy, and to strengthen community resilience in the context of climate change. And so we, we do this through this kind of framework of shifting hearts, shifting minds, and shifting policies and practices. And so in terms of shifting hearts, we really tell the story of um, the cradle to grave impacts of coal-based coal, um, coal energy production, which is one of the reasons why we have a bit of a challenge with with um, solutions like uh, carbon capture and sequestration because it doesn't deal with the fact that 76,000 coal miners have died of black lung disease since 1968. And that we, it, meanwhile, the mining industry has fought actively year after year against having regulations around coal mine dust. So from cradle to grave, whether it's the coal mine dust from mining coal or it's the coal ash residuals from the, you know, from the under-regulation of coal um, combustion processes, cradle to grave, the coal combustion um, as an energy production process is, is a dangerous practice, both in terms of the communities that house those facilities, the workers that are engaged in those, in those activities, and of course the harm to the planet with coal-fired power plants being the number one contributor to carbon dioxide emissions, which is the number one driver of climate change. Um, this, in talk, talking about community impacts, this is a Navajo family in the Four Corners region out west. The coal fire power plant behind them is um, one of five coal fire power plants within a 50 mile radius of their home. They, 70% of the people on this reservation don't have electricity and, and the two coolers are on their porch because they also don't have running water like 70% of the people on the reservation. The plant, the uh, electricity from those two coal plants goes to, to uh, power Phoenix, Las Vegas, and, and Los Angeles for the most part. And so, um, so the, the, the communities, they came in with the promise of jobs and most of the jobs in the coal plants have actually gone to the people who they brought in. So the, the actual population of these communities increase when the when the plants come in because they come in with their own workers as opposed to the people who are in the community. So the plants only the, the communities only get the negative side. And even there's no men in this picture because these men are actually working in different states because they don't have any jobs in the communities where they live in because of the lies with the coal fired power plants that came in. So they, they actually only get to come home every couple of months um, to be with their own families. And they're holding a picture of someone who passed away from a respiratory illnesses illness. And they talked about the other respiratory illnesses in that family. So they only get the, the illness and the challenges, but don't actually get any of the quote unquote benefits from the coal fired power plants in their communities. Folks who are um, disproportionately subsistence fisher folks include low income communities and communities of color. And again, these coal fired power plants and other facilities are disproportionately located in these communities. 71% of African Americans live in a county in violation of air pollution standards. 56% um, of us all live in counties in violation of air pollution standards. 68% of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal fired power plant. And Latino Americans and indigenous communities have similar types of statistics. And so we're fishing out of these waters that are contaminated with mercury, that have mercury advisories that are posted because of the, um, the habits of these communities culturally in terms of being subsistence fisher folks. This is a Cesar Chavez High School where this oil refinery is one of five oil refineries within a 10 mile radius of the school. And again, because in, in Houston, it's such a um, pro-business situation that they actually don't really have zoning laws. So this is why you have these kind of things right on top of schools, right on top of, um, of um, houses. And again, it's kind of this, this, uh, this notion of business above all, above the rights and the well-being of communities that are host to these types of um, industries. This, um, I gave a training once and the fo two people came in late and they said they had to take their grandson to the hospital um, for his asthma. And they just talked about how this is just a regular thing in, in their lives because of his asthma being so severe. They live two miles away from a coal fired power plant. They sent me this picture with the medicines and they also sent me this picture showing him, that's Antoine over there, and then this little child playing in the fountain. And they talked about how this is emblematic of his life, always looking on while other kids are playing or while other kids are going to school, but because of the severity of his asthma, his whole activities are truncated. And we also, we, we tie this to 
the NAACP's larger agenda around education rights and so forth. And we know that if you're, you might be in school and you're having a hard time paying attention because of lead that comes out of these smokestacks, you might not be able to go to school because of poor air quality days to which these types of facilities contribute to. And then if you're living next to these facilities, which most of these kids do, then your property values are on average 15% lower. And we know that property values are what finances our school systems. And so when you have this combination of under-resourced schools, kids who are in school having a hard time paying attention or kids who are out of school because of poor air quality days, it ties into the work that we do on the school to prison pipeline. Because if you're not on grade level by the third grade, you're more likely to enter into the criminal justice system. So these are just um, some of the ways that we see this connection in terms of the drivers of climate change. And then when we look on the impact side, we see how um, the, the, the so this is what once fertile and rich soil and what it looks like now because we these drought-like conditions we're seeing as a result of climate change. Already the communities that I work in are in situations of food insecurity where they're more likely to get their food from a corner store than a grocery store, much less a farmer's market. And that means they're getting food that is full of pres preservatives, sodium, sugars, but none of the rich antioxidants and nutrients and that we need to be able to, to sustain our lives. Instead, it's life-sapping types of things that people are taking into their bodies. And then we know with the sea level rise that is that we don't talk about as much as disasters and so forth, but places like the Maldives, which in less than 20 years is actually going to be underwater. They're talking to Papua New Guinea, Solomon's Island, other countries to move their entire populace to other countries. And they actually had a cabinet meeting underwater in 2009 to illustrate internally into the world that this is where they're heading pretty soon. And they're not alone because right here in the United States, you might not be able to see the scuba diver there, but we know with, with the Superstorm Sandy, that, that there's, this, there's the storms themselves, but then there's also the storm surge that is going to only intensify as we have this increased sea level rise. And places like um, Kivalina Island in Alaska and Thibodeau, Louisiana, within 15 years are being displaced due to sea level rise. Thibodeau is losing a football field of land a day because of the combination of sea level rise and the land is sinking because of excessive oil drilling off of their shores. And so then we have these types of scenarios with disasters and the impacts that we've seen there. We've seen things with Katrina and you know, we, we all know the stories there, who's most impacted, who has the least ability to be able to be resilient to these types of impacts. And then when we tie our kind of relationship with some of these communities with these toxic facilities and the fact that, um, that these, these disasters are coming through, this, this facility actually had an alert. It's a, it's a nuclear plant. I think um, Mr. Oppenheimer and I are on the same side around the <laughs> nuclear piece. But um, the nuclear plant right next to this community in Port Gibson, Mississippi, where they were afraid that it was going to be overtaken because of the the um, storms, the, the uh, yeah, the the, uh, the storm that was happening there and the flooding that was happening, and so we look at the communities and their impacts and so forth. I won't go through this because uh, my seven minutes is probably I'm already up. But we also look at the economic justice pieces as well, and we tie some of our uh, solutions around to some of the economic justice um, work, and including the when we talk about needing to shift from coal-fired power plants, we recognize that people work in those plants that you know that that there's livelihoods that'll be lost even if they're not necessarily from that community. So we're really talking about a just transition when we're talking about shifting from coal, just transition in terms of training, in terms of jobs, and so forth. And we, we, when we talk about making our um, com communities more resilient for the impacts of climate change, then we're intentional about making sure that that's also tied with economic justice goals as well. So we don't want to trade one set of problems for, for another with, um, with the natural gas situation. We also overlay the fact that, as you know, that um, Oklahoma, for example, and last year they, had, they have on average 30, um, 30 earthquakes on, that are 3.5 on the Richter scale. But last year they had 300 plus um, earthquakes that were 3.5 on the Richter scale. And that's why they're calling for a uh, ban on, on, um, on hydraulic fracturing because they're tying that to fracking. And this picture actually t shows an overlay between the plants, the coal-fired power plants throughout the country and the earthquake fault zones throughout the country. And the ones that are black triangle are the ones that are built on the same model as the Fukushima Daiichi plant, which we all know was impacted by the, the tsunami situation. So we really are looking at a potential recipe for a disaster with our, our excessive drilling that we're doing for fracking and our, um, and our nuclear plants throughout, throughout the country. So, 
And then, so then we tie this all to our political system, which is um, holding us back from the decisions we need to make to, to really um, have the types of policy that we've all talked about so far. And we know what's driving a lot of these decisions or lack thereof. Um, and so we, we really want to make sure that we're, we're, we're being explicit and intentional about taking back our democracy so we don't have our democracy stumped, stomped on by big money. Um, and so we are really looking at tying the voting rights and, and civic engagement to our, our, our struggle for climate justice. And so just wrapping up, we're making sure that we're staying active around, around engaging with the EPA and, and at the Public Service Commission's, Public Utilities Commission, so we're really making our voice heard that we are, um, this is just a quote that I won't read you because our time is up, but working also community by community, making um, links across communities. This is actually, we're out there with some of the Navajo and other tribes and Appalachian <coughs> groups and so forth, really coming together under this banner of power without, without pollution, energy without injustice. And, and working on not only trying to push for policy change, but also growing our own types of, um, of change at our local level, working on um, emergency management, community-based emergency management, working on growing our own food through local food movements, um, working on um, energy entrepreneurship in terms of um, community-owned solar, creating jobs through this with partners like the Grid Alternatives. This is a community that actually had their lights cut off by Detroit Edison because they couldn't pay their street lights. And so Detroit Edison not only sh shut off their street lights because they couldn't pay, this is a the town is called Highland Town or Highland Park, Michigan. But after a while they decided they were never gonna be able to pay for their street lights, so they actually took the street poles out as well. And so, but this community came together and they got solar energy, um, solar panels, and they, they bought new street poles, put them up, put solar panels on those street poles, and now they're, they have light again in their community. And those are the kind of initiatives that we're pushing for with education, um, green, green schools, um, community-owned um, uh, recycling so that we're not throwing away so much. Um, like I said, our local food movements, looking at transportation equity, as I said, community-based emergency management, legal remedies where necessary, making sure we're engaging around civic engagement, and, and really being intentional about having frontline communities in the lead so that other people aren't designing solutions for our communities that we're really pushing and, and being at the decision-making table ourselves. Some of the principles that we do around um, decision-making and just kind of our, our motto as we all need to work together because um, you know the motto of the People's Climate Movement was to change everything we need everyone and it's, it is quite true. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jackie, that was great. It's now my honor to introduce Catherine Gajewski, who's the Director of Sustainability in the City of Philadelphia, where she's responsible for the implementation of GreenWorks Philadelphia, the city's sustainability framework unveiled by Mayor Nutter in April 2009. The framework, which I'm sure she'll talk more about, sets goals in five areas related to energy, environment, equity, economy, and engagement and it encompasses more than 150 achievable, measurable initiatives. Prior to her joining the administration as a director of sustainability, she served as a special assistant to the chief of staff in the mayor's office. She managed a number of major citywide projects, including the Philly Spring Cleanup, which in its first year was recognized as the largest citywide cleanup in US history. Uh, previously, she also led many community outreach efforts and served as an advisor to Mayor Nutter and senior members of the Nutter administration on a wide range of policy issues with a particular focus on sustainability. <clears throat> She's also worked as an aide uh, to Councilman Nutter office in 2006 and before arriving in Philadelphia, Catherine worked for land conservation organizations in Vermont and Seattle. She holds a BA from Wesleyan University Please welcome Catherine Gajewski. Oh, 
Uh, we've covered a lot of territory, so I'll try to keep this really brief so we can go on to um, conversation and questions. But I think in summary, we have a global problem in front of us that is um, demonstrating local impacts of a wide variety and demanding local action. So I just want to talk briefly about what we're doing here in Philadelphia and really what's starting to take shape in cities across the country and across the world as we all grapple together with the climate change problem and some of the um, opportunities that I think also are included there. So I'm part of this very uh, nascent movement of urban sustainability, and even just 10 years ago, it, I, we, it didn't really exist. So the pace of change around some of these issues is coming together quite rapidly, um, but the context that we're working in is also changing quite rapidly. When I took my position on in 2008, 2009, and we put out our sustainability plan, climate adaptation still wasn't really a term that was being used. And we thought, well, we need to be dealing with mitigation, but this will all basically get sorted out with a cap and trade rule, which we think will come down the pipe from the federal government any day now. Um, how quickly our politics have changed. And here we are in 2015, trying to figure out at the local level how we're moving forward with both mitigation and adaptation. So we're all kind of making up this field as we go along, which is really exciting and also quite terrifying because the scale and the pace of change that's required with all of the science we've overviewed um, so succinctly tonight demands very, very fast-paced action at a very, very large scale that will challenge all of these um, old legacy systems and decision-making processes that we've held dear for so, so long. We're gonna to have to be fundamentally recreating our society, and with that comes the opportunity to rebuild and reshape our cities and the communities that we live in. So just a few um, thoughts here based on what our experience has been in Philadelphia. You know, we're looking at two layers of responsibility as a city government, both what we own and operate as a city government, and in most places the city is the largest landowner, the largest energy user, so on and so forth. That's true in Philadelphia, it's true in New York City, it's true in Baltimore. So we have to deal with our own footprint and how we change um, our decision-making processes. And then we have a responsibility to our constituents to bring leadership to citywide issues and to figure out how we can be making changes that impact um, all of our residents and development patterns, so on and so forth. But we're doing all of this within a context that presents a number of challenges. There are market forces and behaviors well beyond um, the grasp of local government. You know, unfortunately, we don't get to decide the grid mix or price of energy. There are these large, sometimes intractable systems that we're just a mere player in. And as we're trying to make all of these positive changes, we're doing it in the context of increasingly extreme weather. So we've had utility programs that have focused on efficiency. We've had increased awareness. We've had a transition from coal to natural gas. Despite all of this here in Philadelphia over the last five plus years, we've barely been able to make a dent in our overall greenhouse gas reductions. We've only had a 1% reduction citywide from 1990 to 2014. Why is that? Because extreme weather is driving heating and cooling. So in both the summer and the winter months, we're using more energy in our buildings, which is driving up energy use, driving up greenhouse gas emissions. So we're trapped in this very, and this is not just Philadelphia, this is happening across the Northeast. We're trapped in this very problematic cycle now of we're starting to see the effects of climate change and it's making it harder for us to counteract those effects. We're seeing that here, we've got to figure out how to get beyond it. And then obviously I was saying before, there's this pace of change that's necessary um, and kind of a, so far a lack of ability or willingness to work at that scale. Um, you know, there's not alignment yet between local government, state government and federal government. We've been talking about this UN framework. We're all kind of working towards common goals with totally different frameworks in place. So we have to figure out how to get some greater alignment between all of these levels so that we can really be maximizing the impacts that we're having. And I'll say that I think that there are tremendous opportunities in all of this. Um, you know, local impact is growing, some of the awareness is growing, some of the action at the local level 
Philadelphia is one now of hundreds and hundreds of cities across the world that are taking action to figure out what it is we can do at the local level to protect our communities and to start reversing some of the effects of climate change. Um, I'll say in closing here that, you know, the next phase here is really just getting to a scale we haven't even conceived of yet. A lot of cities are now thinking about 80 by 50, and we've been working with Drexel University to do some of the analysis around what that would take in Philadelphia. So the climate science demands that we reduce emissions 80% by 2050, which is really just around the corner. It takes about like 10 years to do a big project here in Philadelphia from design to development. So we need to be now kind of designing the world we're going to be living in in 2050. And it's very tricky because that scale of change is so beyond um, how we're currently working. So a city like Philadelphia, we all together need to really decide what are our priorities? What kind of city do we want to be in the coming years, in the coming decades? How are we going to make some of the hard decisions that are going to be required to move in that direction? But I think ultimately there is a chance here to be rebuilding cities with sustainable development at the core in ways that work for our environment, work for people, and work for certainly some of the equity goals we've been talking about tonight. So um, look forward to the conversation and look forward to working with all of you to see how we can put this into action here in Philadelphia. So now I'd like to invite all of our speakers up to the stage, if you could have a seat here. And we are opening the floor uh, for questions. There are mics at uh, stands in each aisle. Uh, you can feel free to get lined up. Great. And as um, we're waiting for folks to come forward with their questions, I think I'll, I'll ask the first one. And first of all, I want to thank each of you for uh, the powerful messages that you provided today. And as I think back of what was presented, I'm wondering, um, in light of the disappointing climate negotiations in the past, do we think the global community will be more inclined to agree to serious reductions in CO2 emissions at talks uh, that will culminate in Paris this year? How, how do we feel like this is going to be different? Who wants to take that on? I'll, I'll take that. Well, I, I think you have to keep your expectations in line with reality. The dolphins have already basically announced that they're not, can you? There you go. Good. That they're not going to abide by How about that? Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Progress. So what you shouldn't expect is hard and fast binding, uh, a, a binding agreement that countries that don't adhere to will be punished. That's not the world we live in. The governments aren't quite comfortable enough to be willing to do that. What this agreement can do is make it easier for the governments to put down specific plans, which they are starting to do, which tell you actually instead of large-scale goals that they may never achieve, very specifically what they will do when they go home. And they, they can be held to account at least in the public arena if, say, four, five, six years from now, they don't do it. That's what this negotiation is about. It's to breathe life into the process of going home and actually implementing real reductions where countries have a reason to do so. For instance, the U.S. wouldn't commit to a specific target which it could be punished for not meeting, but it did commit to an overall and in some ways very specific plan for implementing reductions. If every country that's important, and there are 15 or 20 of them, actually do that, we will have made more progress through this effort than has been made in the last 25 years of the negotiation. And I just to conclude, I think for the first time, you see most of the governments that are emitting, responsible for most of the emissions, actually believe they really have to do this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our first question over here. Well, uh, I've heard a lot about the decarbonization of energy, but what about uh, reducing the kilojoules per year per capita? Because that seems like the other side of the equation. 
And I haven't heard much about that. Good. Energy use per person per year. Yeah, definitely uh, the, the uh, first order of business is uh, being able to uh, be more efficient in energy use. Uh, let me give you some numbers uh, just to keep this in, in context. Uh, the, world, the world is emitting around 34 or 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide <coughs> from burning coal, oil, and gas each year. There are 7.3 billion people on the planet, so it's roughly about five tons per person. The United States emits about 17 tons per person. We're rich, we use a lot of energy, uh, and uh, it's uh, fossil fuel based. Poor countries are on the other end, uh, down near zero, uh, but they want more energy use. And so if they were to become more like the US economy over time, uh, the uh, overall amounts would rise significantly. To get on that downward path, we have to reach zero sometime in the second half of this century. And in the famous graph that I showed, famous uh, from uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that Michael has uh, helped to lead, uh, the curve cuts at zero in the year 2070. And on that curve, by mid-century, just 35 years from now, which is like nothing, as, as you mentioned, uh, from the point of view of infrastructure and uh, energy use, we have to be on average worldwide at about 1.2 or 1.5 tons per person. Think of it now. The United States is at 17 tons of CO2 per person per year. And the rest of the world isn't going to give us a pass, you know. Oh, go on, we'll stop using energy, but you just continue on as you're doing. So if we're going to do this in a politically agreed way, we all have to make this effort, and that means the U.S. has to reduce 80 or 90 percent by mid-century. When's the last time you heard the government have an actual plan like that? <laughs> what have you thought about the U.S. government's long-term energy plan? Well, the, the answer is nothing, because it doesn't exist. It's never been done, never been made. And just to add one more obvious point, not to belabor it, but we're incoherent, as you know. I don't want to say it out loud. Uh, but um, President Obama went to Alaska recently to dramatize how important uh, it is uh, to get the climate change under control. But just a couple of weeks earlier, the U.S. government had given a new license to Shell for Arctic exploration. You know what? This makes no sense under any scenario in the world. Thank you. Um, in, looking at, in looking at the uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, worldwide, uh, I didn't see any mention of the issue of population growth. Here we are going from 7.3 billion to somewhere around 9 or 10 billion. In addition to those 2 billion souls, they're probably going to be expecting more of a middle income level of, uh, of life than a poverty level of life. Uh, is this just too difficult an issue to grapple with, uh, or is it in there somewhere? It's uh, not in there anywhere. Uh, and uh, it has been uh, too hot to handle uh, for at least a, a generation. Um, very, uh, it's, it's actually quite uh, odd and troubling in, in some ways. You know, in the 1960s and 1970s, the issue of population was, uh, of course, uh, quite prominent. Uh, and it led to the uh, terrible abuses, for example, of the forced sterilization and, and uh, coercion uh, that led to a kind of backlash that coupled with uh, also uh, differences in uh, religious and moral views so that in 1994, at another UN meeting uh, <coughs> on population in Cairo, actually the idea of population as being 
itself a direct concern was taken off the table and the issues of sexual and reproductive rights were strongly featured, which I think we would all share. But I regret the fact that discussion about population as a concern was actually removed almost entirely from the global discourse. And this is a kind of mistake. Uh, what I can say about the state of affairs is that most parts of the world actually have had what we call the demographic transition to low birth rates, low fertility rates of two or below. So in most of the world, the population is tending to stabilize and uh, this is happening in societies of uh, all different uh, faiths. It's, uh, um, uh, and even with the Catholic Church prescription on contraception, it doesn't matter in practice. Uh, in a lot of the Catholic countries in the world, uh, there's a very widespread contraceptive <coughs> use and low fertility rates. There's one part of the world where fertility remains very, very high, and that's in Africa. Sub-Saharan African fertility is about 5.2 children on average per woman, uh, what's called the total fertility rate. And if you think about that, it means that on average, every mother is having, on average, more than two uh, daughters uh, who will then, in their generation, uh, uh, be replacing uh, the mother, and that means there's a tendency for the population to be doubling uh, at uh, a quite rapid rate. So even taking into account the gradual, slow fertility decline in Africa, what the latest UN population scenario showed in what's the medium scenario is that Africa's population would reach an astounding four billion people by 2100. And to give you the context of that, the estimated total population of Sub-Saharan Africa in 1950 was 179 million. And in uh, today, the estimate is about 950 million, so roughly five times increase since 1950. And then, as I just told you, two more doublings to reach four billion people by the end of this century. I think as a development economist, it's impossible for that scenario to be combined with good living standards and environmental sustainability. I can't see how that could happen. So I advocate a decline, a voluntary based <coughs> decline of fertility rates at a rapid rate and the proven way to accomplish that is one overriding method, and that is make sure that girls get an education. <laughs> and so if we, if we honor SDG 4 of universal secondary education, we will have a dramatic decline of fertility rates, and that needs to happen for Africa's own good, uh, as well as for uh, the, the global scene, but certainly for Africa's own good and for the escape from poverty. Of course, one also needs sexual and reproductive rights. Uh, one needs access to contraception, uh, and one needs uh, that uh, understanding and, and leadership in society. I think it's notable, by the way, that Pope Francis, uh, you may remember on his way back from the Philippines last year, uh, when uh, asked by uh, a woman, an impoverished woman who had seven children, uh, what to do, he said, uh, being a good Catholic does not mean breeding like rabbits. And then he said to pardon the expression. Uh, so Pope Francis opened up an issue that has been hard to discuss inside the church. Uh, he opened it up, uh, and I think we should follow that uh, discussion. There is a church uh, doctrine called responsible parenthood, 
uh, and it's very important in my mind. It says that, that parents uh, should also uh, be able to raise their children responsibly and out of poverty and with decent nutrition, health care, and education, and that uh, requires parental responsibility, mm -hmm. it seems to me. Thank you. Next question here. I was going to say something else, but I'm the youngest kid of 10 in a Catholic family, so I feel like... Uh, <laughs> Welcome. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask about hard choices, compromises, trade-offs. Uh, you've each sort of talked a little bit about that, and uh, you've alluded to some specific examples, nuclear, fracking. I think uh, the sort of personal comfort of heating and cooling uh, in, in what you're talking about, the heating costs. So I just wanted to give you all an opportunity to put on our agenda. The people here are all the pre-selected folks that are already thinking about this, but what aren't people talking about enough, in your you know, perspective, in your vantage point, put a hard choice, a compromise that's not yet being talked about that you wish people were talking about, wrestling with now, if there's enough time. I mean, I'll just give you, I'll just give you one out of my own personal experience. I have a, I summer on a place called Block Island which is off Montauk Point and part of Rhode Island. And um, the f the, uh, while uh, there was a squabble over offshore wind uh, in um, Nantucket Sound, and that proposal seems to, it's gonna go under probably due to more of the, the, both the political and financial problems. We also had an offshore wind proposal that was made. And it's a, basically a vacation community and building a big wind farm has deep and serious visual impacts for at least half the island. Uh, but the proposal was discussed seriously by the community, and there were people opposed and people against, but a sort of a, um, a, a consensus evolved that the issue of not only the price of electricity on the island, but the sustainability of an island community which was generating its energy from diesel fuel was so important that the individual NIMBY considerations of the people who weren't so happy about having their high-priced land overlooking wind generators, uh, that that balance, those decisions had to be made and the community struggled with it and it wasn't completely the people who were looking at the, wind, the potential wind sites were all against and the others looking the other way were all for, but it was an intelligent, rational discussion where people felt it wasn't being forced on them, but they felt somewhat at least some of them felt empowered to actually participate in the decision. And eventually, a decision was made uh, to go ahead. And it's now going to be the site of the first offshore wind farm in the United States. And I hope it works out well. And it, you know, it's not, there is no model for doing th those kinds of things. But it's the kind of decision that it's going to be have to be faced <laughs> again and again and again, whether it's a matter of the trade-off of can we make uh, uh, natural gas pipelines tight enough so uh, fracking, at least from the methane leakage point of view, if not necessarily the water pollution point of view, is uh, giving us the greenhouse gas, gas benefit it's supposed to. Can we, if, if uh, carbon capture and storage actually becomes affordable, which isn't clear at all, uh, what about those? Are we going to invest in getting rid of the other impacts of mining coal, for instance? Everything has a problem on the flip side of the benefit. And we just, we always make decisions about trade-offs. We have to get a lot better of it. And who's the we is really the important thing. Things getting forced down people's throats just will not make an energy revolution. Now piggybacking on your, your comments, Michael, I, I think I have a question specifically for Catherine or Jackie. Um, you know, community initiatives addressing climate change often focus specifically on local climate-related problems. So as you've researched community successes in addressing climate change, have you uncovered any principles or best practices that other communities can follow? Well, I might let you answer that one, but I just wanted to add on there. I think it's really, I, in my perspective, <coughs> I think it's been very hard to have a good, strong conversation about trade-offs because we're still so uneducated about the basics that we need to really be way more educated on in order to have that conversation. You know, most people, whether it be in Philadelphia or, you know, Cincinnati or anywhere else, don't understand 
what the energy system fueling their city is and how that works. And so to have, you know, this really comes down largely, a lot of these questions come down to grid mix and how we're supplying energy to our cities and our countries. And in Philadelphia, you know, we've had this energy hub conversation. We've had a lot of conversations arise in the last couple of years that I think have shown our vulnerability and how um, prepared we are to get into these conversations in any amount of depth and reality. So I think part of this trade-off conversation needs to also be about how we work together to better educate ourselves about what some of the underlying issues are that we need to be grappling with in order to make some of those decisions. And we can't just have a few decision makers in a few places understanding the complexities involved. We all, I think, need to be figuring out how to better educate ourselves as a community to be figuring out uh, what direction we want to go in. You know, another tension is um, the need for deep infrastructure investment and community investment, and then some of the tensions around affordability. So I think these are some of the issues we really are going to need to take on in the coming years. And I'll can let you take the start? second question, Jackie. Sure, yeah. so, um, can, can you hear me? No. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Um, so the the uh, I guess the principle that we really are pushing in, in the work that we do from, from a community standpoint is community leadership and community local self-reliance and, and building, um, strengthening local economies. And through doing that, not only are we making communities more resilient and we're making sure that communities are making decisions for themselves instead of having things happen to them or being done to them or quote unquote for them, but it also, it also uh, builds the types of society that we need to be able to, 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 to mitigate climate change and to survive climate change. So when we're talking about um, local food movements. It's not just, it's, it's not only about um, helping communities to be able to have local nutritious foods and keeping wealth in communities, but it's also about cutting down on shipping and trucking and all the different things that are needed to move food from one place to another. It also cuts down on the, the power of groups like Big Ag, which, which does all these unsustainable practices that actually advance and, and, and contribute to climate change. Similarly with energy, we have energy companies who are actively pushing against the types of regulations that we need to be able to protect our health and well-being. But if, we de we de de if we're decentralizing energy production and, and really emphasizing um, energy efficiency and from a community-led standpoint, then we are um, helping to democratize our society better because of the, the un undue influence that energy companies have over our policies while also making sure to power communities and keeping wealth in communities. And I can give example after example of the same, but that's the principle that we're espousing. Thank you. I believe we're here. Thank you. Thank you one and all on the panel for your work and instruction in uh, ecological integrity and social justice. The Pope calls for climate solutions that take care of the poor, that address the poor, particularly in an ener energy shift from fossil fuels to clean renewable energy. Looking forward to Paris, are there any champions, particularly from the US, that would back pricing carbon, giving that dividend to a flat return to um, households across the country? to aid the folks in a energy transition. Who wants to take that on? You know, there, there's been a conversation about that for a long, long time, going back a couple of decades. And it's tied into an even larger conversation about whether, uh, you know, the, a car, the whole tax system could be renovated to uh, get more Rev less revenue from uh, taxing income and more from, say, a carbon tax, for instance. It's part of a conversation about consumption taxes. And my own view on the whole thing has been turning over the tax system will happen sometime when, you know, kingdom comes, basically. It's a, it takes forever. And so I personally thought, you know, that there had to be shorter term things that would happen first. And as someone mentioned before, it was in that from that point of view that the uh, that the uh, a lot of us thought that the cap and trade legislation would pass and that would take care of the problem at least temporarily in terms of getting this a price on carbon. That didn't happen. And the more that the political system 
gets to seem dysfunctional, the more there's, there do seem to be elements that are, you know, there's sort of these weird left-right coalitions that are happening. And one of them happens to be around a trade-off between uh, doing something about a price on carbon and maybe redistributing the proceeds in some way. And then different people have different ideas about, you know, what, how to use that money. But I would say I'm less pessimistic that something like that could happen right now. But don't expect the U.S. government to go to an international negotiation and talk about U.S. domestic taxes. It's simply not going to happen. Nor will there be discussion about a global tax. That isn't going to happen either. But strange things could happen in U.S. politics over the next five years or so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just uh, to add, I, I thought you were uh, going to take a little bit different turn, which is uh, the uh, issue of what a rich country like the United States might do to help poor places uh, to make adjustments, to adapt, uh, to uh, even have uh, modern energy services. Part of the discussion leading up to Paris is supposed to be about international climate financing. The rich countries in uh, 2009 pledged $100 billion a year by 2020 to help finance the energy transition in the low-income countries. We're now September 21st. There hasn't been, uh, in, in my view, one hour of coherent discussion on this since uh, 2009. It's a little understandable uh, from say, President Obama's point of view, this is no doubt the least popular thing that could be discussed is not only this whole issue when he faces such a strong organized uh, opposition in the Congress, but also add in foreign assistance elements to this and it becomes completely uh, off the charts in terms of uh, American uh, political discourse. The fact of the matter is, uh, however, Poor countries need help. We are, I think, extremely unwise and allergic uh, in uh, our inability to think clearly about these issues. And the rest of the world is saying, uh, where's all this, uh, where's any of the help that was promised uh, in the past? What are we really supposed to do about that? Because there are a lot of desperately poor people, and uh, they kind of expect a place on the planet for themselves also, and expected some help coming from the U.S. So I just want to mention that. Uh, it's become a very odd part of our political life in this country that there's almost a, a, a bipartisan view, don't talk about anything about U.S. doing anything positive for another part of the world, we might debate whether we should bomb another place in the world or go to war or give weapons. That's within the ambit of discussion. But the idea that we might help another place in the world has disappeared from our politics, I would say, on a bipartisan basis. No party will take it up. Uh, and I find it really regrettable. And just to give you the numbers, we spend about $600 billion a year on uh, the upfront military costs. We spend even more than that if you add some of the, the hidden costs and veterans benefits and so on. But we spend about $600 billion a year on the military and our total foreign aid is $30 billion a year. I don't believe that keeps us safe at all <laughs> to have a 20-fold ratio of the military approach to the development approach to global problems, but we're completely trapped in our strange politics right now that no party, neither party, I should say, takes this up. So I'm being told we'd have about eight minutes left, so we'll try Thank to you. take a few more questions. Over here. Hi, um, I'm a student from Drexel University, uh, engineering student, and uh, a part of fossil fuel Drexel. Um, so my question is concerning the fossil fuel divestment movement. And um, so notable universities like Stanford University has partially divested from coal. Um, Governor Jerry Brown of California has divested um, around 300 million from uh, healthcare pensions. Um, 
And the Rockefeller Foundation has also divested from, I believe, coal and some fossil fuels. How do the members of this panel feel about fossil fuel divestment as a, as a tool to bring the discussion uh, to a moral basis, to uh, push policy, and so on? Great question. Well, if we had divested last year, uh, the universities would have saved a lot of money. Uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the coal industry is going bankrupt, and that's, that's fine. Uh, uh, and uh, oil has been a lousy investment. Um, and I think the fact of the matter is that uh, at a minimum, uh, if a company uh, in uh, the fossil fuel industry is to stay in the portfolio, you ought to have a very strong case of what its business model is going to be in a safe world. Uh, and. Uh, the recommendation I've made to our university, Colum my, my own university, Columbia University, is uh, uh, that at a minimum, uh, it has to screen uh, its uh, portfolio <coughs> companies that uh, are in the uh, endowment and ask them the question, do you, uh, where's, where's your place in a safe climate world? Uh, and why would you still be a good investment? Uh, and what are you doing about it to contribute to the climate transition? I don't think we'd get the right answers from uh, most of these companies. And given that, I would uh, advocate divestment. So basically, I've advocated for a two-step process uh, in which the companies uh, have the chance to come clean, tell us what their business model is and why it makes sense, and if they can't pass the test, uh, to divest. Uh, I think it's uh, from a as you said, from a moral point of view, extremely important. I really was very unhappy when Harvard President Drew Faust uh, said uh, that the job of the university is to maximize the returns on the portfolio so that it can do its business. I think this is an absolutely incorrect, do its educational priorities. I think this is an absolutely incorrect view of how universities should act. On the other side, I'll say I think it's very hard to be a customer. If, if you're not going to be an investor, but you're still a customer, the contradiction to me there is just too stark. You know, so, you know, a city of Philadelphia, and this is a conversation that's really originated with universities, but started to come up with governments and thinking about pension funds and also municipal finances. But, you know, the city of Philadelphia spends $100 million a year on our energy bills to run the city. And so, you know, until we can figure out how to be fundamentally transitioning away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy, I feel like it's a really tricky and contradictory statement to make. So I think putting viable energy plans in place that help large institutions, anchor institutions all across the United States start to transition in real ways is more impactful potentially than the divestment movement. Still very important, but as long as we're customers, that's where, that's where the whole business is fueled. So I, I'd like to see that part of the conversation be a little bit more balanced out. Can I respond? I'm gonna, I'm gonna disagree with that. Please. Uh, <laughs> the interesting thing about the fossil fuels is uh, not only do we have to make the transition, but we've already discovered uh, and uh, have in reserves, proved reserves, which mean the economically available reserves, far more fossil fuels than we can ever safely use. And so what we really want the companies to do is to stop developing and exploring for new fossil fuels. Uh, and this is why the constraint on investment is really so important. We don't want shell drilling in the Arctic. We don't need Arctic oil and gas. That's simple. Uh, we don't want, I mean, if, if we ever build that Keystone Pipeline, our next job is to make sure that that company goes bankrupt. Uh, because we, do, we don't need, we don't, we don't need the uh, oil sands. Uh, we have more than enough lower cost, lower carbon energy than we need. So what we need to do is actually stop the exploration and development of new hydrocarbon reserves, as well as making the transformation. But I thought you said something really 
very, very right and deep uh, that I think is the point here for us as individuals, even for Philadelphia as a, as a you know, city, which is we live in systems. Uh, so I can't determine as an individual very much uh, when I flip on the, I can't determine at all what the power generation is behind uh, the light coming on. I want the light coming on. So I don't see it as a contradiction. Uh, if the light coming on is coming from a fossil fuel based power plant right now, I can't help it as an individual. I'm gonna go for the electricity. I do want my city government and my state government and my federal government making sure that in 10 years when the light switch goes on that a much higher proportion of that's coming from a low carbon source. So I don't see it as a contradiction. You're stuck buying fossil fuels right now. That's the system, as you pointed out. It's not a contradiction to also support divestment. It's not a moral contradiction. No one should be saying, in my view, don't use electricity. We need electricity. That's our system that we live in. But we are saying to you and to the mayor and to uh, Mayor de Blasio and to President Obama and so forth, take the steps working with the Drexel engineers to find out what is the alternative and move towards that as soon as possible uh, and on a long-term plan that's really gonna get us to the decarbonized energy system. In other words, of, every day somebody you know, calls me, they call me all sorts of things, <laughs> but they say, you know, how dare you fly an airplane? Uh, you're a hypocrite. Well, technically you are. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I think the point is I want the aviation industry to move towards advanced biofuels or other solutions. I'm not advocating that we don't fly airplanes or don't use electricity and so forth. I am, of course, like all of us, advocating that we don't waste what we can uh, economically conserve and so we move to energy efficiency. But the real goal here, in my view, is not to close down our energy system. It's to make the transformation to a new energy system. And in the meantime, we are going to be using fossil fuels, but on that downward course. And we need to get onto a path that is on a downward course. I view that as completely consistent with the divestment movement, actually. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I, I'll disagree back, but we don't have enough time. And in fact, we are out of time. Um, I, I would like, out of respect for some trains we have leaving, to close this, but I know a few of our panelists will be around, so I encourage those of you who have questions to try to catch them. But um, I really want to thank our panelists for this <laughs> critical dialogue. <clears throat> this was just a, a, a wonderful opportunity to discuss the critical issues, and I realize that there's so much more that we can discuss. So I thank uh, all of our audience members for participating. Again, on behalf of the Academy, this was a wonderful program, and thank you very much. Good night. Okay.